At a young age of five, I already knew I wanted to become a TV personality. Joining a talent competition gave me an opportunity to enter the entertainment industry. As young as I was, God answered my prayers by allowing me to star in my first ever lead role in a movie at the age of 10. From then on, my career immensely flourished. At the peak of my career, I unexpectedly got pregnant at the age of 22 while unmarried. To avoid damaging my career, my manager then suggested that I fly overseas to have the baby in secret and never admit that I had him. I knew this was not right, so I chose to get married and accepted the end of my career. My decision drastically changed my life's direction. I started questioning God, wondering why me of all people, especially at the height of my career. It felt like a rug has been swept from under me and my life was turned upside down. Goodbye showbiz, hello motherhood in a blink of an eye. Several years later, I lost my first husband to nasopharyngeal cancer when I was 26 years old. This left me struggling to understand what was going on in my life. Suddenly, I am a single mom left to take care of my then four-year-old son. I didn't know how to recover. I was confronted with another big why, God, why. Out of desperation, I knew God is my only hope. My curiosity led me to attend Christian services to understand who God really is. During this time, I learned to surrender all in prayer and to His will. As I started to seek Him more, I realized that I may not understand what was happening now, but I learned to trust God's character and that He causes all things, the good and the bad, to work together for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. Knowing Him as my Lord and Savior, I knew he has wonderful plans for me, even if I still don't know it. At that point in my life, with no plans of remarriage, I focused on work so I can give my son a good and comfortable life, not knowing that God had greater plans. I was home when I first received a message from VJ, my grade school classmate whom I got reconnected with that same year. It was the start of a consistent conversation that led us to get to know more of each other. Still feeling scared and traumatized of everything from what has happened in the past, my sincere prayer was for God's guidance for me and my son. I only want his will and nothing else. Even though I had no plans to be in a relationship, VJ was very persistent in showing me his sincere intentions toward me and my son, Nathan. Fast forward to today, VJ and I are now married, enjoying the love we share as a blended family with four kids. Looking back on the past 12 years, God revealed his answer to all my whys. I learned prayer is God's way of making me more dependent on Him, and it is God's way of drawing me closer to Him. He allowed me to go all through that to see and appreciate the blessings that comes only from Him. Through His strength, nothing is too overwhelming. We just need to keep holding on to His promises, be persistent in praying and in seeking His will, and in His right time, all the good things He has planned out for you will be revealed. Now, my life is a true testament of this verse, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. What I have planned for myself was nothing compared to God's plans for me. As I seek Him and allow His hand to move in my life, God opened more doors of blessings all in obedience to Him. Once a widow and a single mom, now happily married to a husband who loves the Lord with four wonderful children. My marriage, my family, and my life today is a true testament of God's amazing grace in my life. To Him be all praise and glory. Praise God. Praise God.
I have invited their whole family to come so we can pray for Camille and Vijay. And their D group leader is Mitch. And the husband has an important engagement. He would have been here. But I praise God for the life of Camille and Vijay. You notice her testimony? Just keep praying. You may not know why. Just keep trusting God. And I praise God also for Mitz, who was there to disciple uh, Camille. How many of you are part of a small group? Raise your hands. You know, guys, I do not like us to be shallow Christians. Either Christianity is true, and you be serious about it, and you grow. Or it is not true, forget about Christianity, don't pretend. Therefore, you have no option to either be on fire for the Lord and not to be on fire. To be on fire for the Lord, you need a small group. You know why? You need each other. That is God's design for the church, to help one another. So I want to thank you, Mitch, for taking the time, okay? And these wonderful children. Is God amazing, yes or no? All right, everybody, raise your right hand. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, I thank you for VJ and thank you for Camille. Thank you for what you have done in her life. How from a widow, she's able to find joy in you, and now you are giving her a bonus, a good husband and wonderful children. I pray for blessings for this special family. Use them as they use their platform to expand your kingdom. And thank you for Mitch and her husband and their faithfulness in discipling others. I pray you also bless them in your most amazing way. And I commit to you, all the people watching us in the satellites, in YouTube, in the Philippines, all over the world, that they will realize prayer is not only a necessity, it is for our own good, it is for our own blessing. So I commit to you this service, this worship service, speak to all of us, override my preparation, and I pray for those who are hurting, that you will comfort them today. In Jesus' name we all pray, amen and amen, God bless. Thank you. By the way, to those of you who did not get to buy tickets, don't worry. But don't buy any more tickets because there is nothing to sell. We are oversold. So what you need to do is you buy the materials which we will make it available for those who did not or who are not able to attend the International Discipleship Congress. Now the good news is this. Some of the speakers will be speaking next Sunday at 12 o'clock. So we have live speakers next Sunday from some of our speakers in the IDC. So next Sunday, what time is our first service? Nine. What time is the second service? Twelve. What time is the next service? Three. What time is the preliminary service? Saturday. What time? Five. So we have four services. And if you still miss it, Go to YouTube, okay? In the meantime, what's the topic today? It's a continuation of the last two weeks. It's about unleashing God's power through prayer. Say that with me. Unleashing God's power through prayer. Today we will discuss unleash God's power. How? Persevere in prayer. Say that with me. Persevere in prayer. What is the meaning of the word persevere? You know, the tendency is for us to give up, especially when your prayers are not answered. How many of you have had unanswered, unanswered prayers? Now, still now. You are still praying. It has not been answered. Raise your hands. That's reality. And your discouragement is you stop praying. I have good news for you. Today you will learn is don't give up praying. Keep praying. And I will tell you why. And I will tell you how. So what's the message today? Unleash God's power. What must you do? Persevere. Persevere means you keep on. Even though you don't feel like doing it anymore. You just keep on doing it. Persevere. Very important. Spiritual quality. Perseverance is a gift from God. So you ask God to help you persevere. Don't give up. So tell your neighbor, don't give up. Don't give up. Keep praying. 
Four important words I want you to know about perseverance, to pray. Number one, perspective. Say that with me. Perspective. Your perspective will impact the way you pray. Perspective is crucial. It's how you see things. All of us have perspective. Number two word is the word plan. What is God's plan when he does not answer our prayer? You must understand plan. God has a plan. You must align with his plan. The third important word is promise. Say that with me. Promise. Do you understand God's promises? Have you claimed any of his promises? And the fourth important word, I call it suspense. Later on, I will tell you, okay? So don't leave, okay? You will stay here until you, heard, until you hear the fourth word, okay? So what is the first word? Perspective. Second word? Plan. Third word? Promise. So let's start with perspective. Why is perspective so important? Can you guess? Perspective impact your thinking. Everybody, point to your head. You know what you think is important? You know why? What do you think will impact your emotion? And your emotion will impact your action. Remember the T principle, T-E-A. Thinking affects emotion, affects your action. But perspective determines how you think. Let me give you an example. There was this airplane flying from one state to another state in the States. And there were a group of children crying and crying. Passengers were irritated. So the father was embarrassed. Because how do you control your children from crying and disturbing other people? So one of the passengers right seated behind them was so irritated. But then the father turned around and explained, we just came from a funeral service. Her, their mother, my wife, just died. When the passenger heard the reason why these children are crying is because their mother just died. Guess what happened to the irritated passenger? Those children continued crying, but was the passenger irritated or no more? No more. Why? His thinking changed. His perspective changed. Instead of irritation, there is sympathy. There is compassion. My friend, many of us do not know how to think because we have wrong perspective. You only have correct perspective if you learn to study the Bible. The Bible gives us the divine perspective, which most of us will not have. The people of the world will not understand divine perspective because for them, it's only based on what they can see in this life. They don't see eternity. Another good example I learned recently is the Battle of Normandy. How many of you have heard or seen the movie D-Day, 1944? The greatest, biggest military operation to invade a continent. Over 150,000 soldiers transported by 7,000 ships, amphibious boats. It's the biggest in the history of the world. On that day, 1944, when they landed in Normandy, from England to Normandy, you can imagine the tragedy, how many people died. Remember, they wanted to stop Hitler from taking over the entire Europe. So the Allied forces had no choice but to galvanize an army to go to Europe. 50 years later, the celebration at Normandy, all the news, you know, television, everybody was there interviewing. Now, this is amazing. They interviewed one of the survivors, a Marine who survived the land invasion, okay, the, from the water to the land. And he said, this is his exact words. Well, maybe not exact words, but he said, I saw all the dead bodies 
the blood all over. In my mind, this is the end. We are finished. Then they interviewed another survivor. This time, he's a pilot. And they asked him what happened that day. He said, as I was flying, I saw the Allied forces, how they were able to penetrate deep into the territory. And in my mind, I know we will surely win. Notice something. Exactly the same battle. One person was seeing it from a horizontal perspective, another one from the sky. And the one from the sky saw more. And he said, we are going to win. The same thing in your life today. I don't know what's going on in your life. Perhaps you're disappointed because you've been praying for a relationship. You have been praying for your family. You have been praying for your financial condition or your children. And nothing is happening. And you feel like giving up. My friend, the message today is unleash God's power. What must you do? Persevere in prayer. You know why? Because God is always at work. So I'm going to share with you how Jesus tried to change the perspective of the disciples. Do you remember last two weeks we discussed how he taught them how to pray? First, how do you pray? Everybody? Our Father who art in heaven. That's the perspective. We put your hands up because you need to support me. You know, when you pray our Father who art in heaven, you are already changing your perspective. You are not praying to somebody who is so busy who has no time for you. You are praying for somebody who loves you, who cares for you. Okay, sit. Okay, you, you can bring it down. So our Father who art in heaven, your perspective has to change. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. Once you pray that your will be done, it's called you have surrendered all your needs. So the next part deals with your needs, physical needs. Give us this day our daily bread. What else? Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven those who are indebted to us. You are asking now for your spiritual needs, forgiveness. And then you are asking for your future needs. Lead us not into trials but deliver us from the evil one. And then he tells you, if your prayers are not answered, what do you do? So let's read. All right? So read Luke 11. Then, notice the word then, after teaching them how to pray, he continues. Then, everybody read, he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend, goes to him at midnight, and says to him, friend, lend me three loaves. A friend of mine has come to me from a journey I have nothing set before him. Notice, the analogy now is when you are praying, imagine you are the friend or you have a friend. So the analogy now changes. When you pray, just think. Now, many people don't know how to interpret this parable. I'm going to tell you how. But first, let me explain to you this story. So he's now giving the story of a friend who is arriving in a place to visit his friend, and the friend went to see a friend. Do you notice that word friend keeps repeating? I will give you a hint. He's telling you that God is more than a friend. While the analogy has to do with a friend, asking for help, I want you to know already, right now the hint, God is more than a friend. So what did this friend do? Well, from inside, he answers and says, do not bother me. The door has been already shut. My children and, and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. Now, you may not understand what is he talking about because today, many of us live in multiple rooms. In a house, you have two bedrooms, three bedrooms. In the time of Jesus, only one room. You sleep together. The kitchen is nearby, but one room. So for the father to get up, he will wake up everybody. So do you understand the context? Why at night? They usually travel at night 
because it is very hot during the daytime. So that's the background. And the guy said, please, don't bother me. Now the story continues. Then the Bible tells us, I tell you, everybody read down, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything, everybody read, because he is his friend. Ah, because of his persistence. Friend and persistence. He will get up and give him as much as he needs. A father, because he is his father, will have the story changed completely. The father will immediately, of course, do it. But he's saying, he is, God is more than a friend. God wants you to know your perspective when you pray is you are not bothering him. You can keep on asking, and God is never bothered. Comprende? What's my proof? Let me show you. Look at another parable, Luke 18. Luke 18 tells us he was telling them a parable to show that everybody at all times, they ought to pray and not lose heart. Why do you lose heart? You know why you lose heart? Because when you pray and nothing seems to happen, you give up. So he's now telling them a story. Keep praying. Don't lose heart. All right? So tell your neighbor, persevere in prayer. Tell your neighbor, persevere. Okay? You got to persevere in prayer. Don't lose heart. Then he introduced two characters. The first one is a judge. The second one is a widow. Let's find out. In a certain city, there was a judge. Now, this judge is not good. Who did not fear God and did not respect man. In other words, walang kwentang judge ito. Nag-antay ng lagay. Okay? There was a widow in that city and she kept coming to him. Now, you will not appreciate this story until you know a widow in the time of Jesus. In the time of Jesus, a widow is completely helpless. They don't have SSS. They don't have Medicare. They don't have places to help widows. So a widow is pathetic. The only way for a widow to survive is when they have children. If they don't have children, no husband, who will take care of the widow? They are the most helpless people. And God is now telling you in this story, many times you and I are like the widow. We are helpless. We need help. There's a judge. But see, do not think God is like this judge. You know why? Because this judge is not a good judge. Give me legal protection from my opponent. The judge will not do it. If you read the story, the judge refused to help the widow. But the lesson of the story is the widow kept bothering the judge. You know how she kept bothering him? You want to know my version? PTC version, chapter 2, verse 1? Wherever the judge will go, bathroom, toilet, wherever, the widow will be there. The widow is always bothering him. So the judge finally said, if I don't help this girl, I'm going to be in trouble. So out of, shall we say, nainis. What is nainis in English? Out of annoyance. Yeah, very good, very good English. Uh, irritation. I better do something. And then Jesus gave the reality. God is not like that. What's my proof? Let's read. The Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge said. The unrighteous judge. So the unrighteous judge, the unrighteous, do you understand? He said, I will help. And now the contrast. Will not God bring about justice for his people who cry to him day and night, will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Meaning, when Jesus comes again, will he find you and me praying? You see, what's the message today? 
Unleash God's power. What must you do? Persevere in prayer. What will make you persevere? What's number one? Perspective. Who are you praying to? God the Father. And God is saying, I am not a bother. You keep coming to me. It's okay. What's my proof? Let's look at Luke 11. Luke 11 tells us, I say to you, now this is a continuation of the story. I say to you, everybody read now, ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock, it will be open to you. Do you notice the grammar here? You will not appreciate the grammar if you read it in the English version. But in the original language, the grammar is very emphatic. Ask means keep asking. Say it with me. Keep asking. Present imperative. God is telling you, keep asking. Don't just ask. Keep asking. Say that with me. Keep asking. Most people think prayer is just asking. Ah, the perspective I want you to see now, look at the plan of God. It includes more than asking. Everybody read. Seek. Say that with me. Keep seeking. That's the meaning. Keep seeking. And you will find. Next, keep knocking. And it will be open. So, the idea is don't give up. Persevere. So, what is the purpose of persevering in prayer? I like this quotation from R.C. Sproul. Prayer does change things. All kinds of things. But the most important thing, it changes who? It changes us. You see, God's purpose when it comes to prayer is not just for you to us. Prayer, perseverance in prayer will make you grow spiritually. Let me explain why. When you pray, what are the possible answers? Tell me, what are the possible answers? Yes. yes. That's all you like, right? Yes. Next. No. Next. Wait. Next. I see most of you do not know the next one. The next one. I, God says, I have something better. Okay? So, first, you all love it. Yes. Next. No. Now, why no? You will not know why no until we finish the explanation. But let me tell you in advance. A father will say no if the request is bad. If I know, you and you are my children, and you ask for something that's not good, what will I say? No. If it is something good, but you are not ready, I will say, wait. And if I have something better, I won't, get, I won't give you what you want now, because I have something what? Better. It's called perspective. Now, what is God's plan? In that case, why will God not answer me immediately? Very simple. Because prayer is not just asking. Prayer is helping you grow spiritually by making you dependent. Do you notice something in your life? I grew most spiritually when there are problems, trials, and I have to be on my knees and I have to be dependent on the Lord. Because I don't just pray once. I pray regularly. And then when I begin to pray more, God begins to sanctify my heart. What do I mean? Guys, what are you really praying for? Think about it. Ladies, what are you praying for? By not answering your prayer, God allows you to listen to the Holy Spirit. You know, persistent prayer is not forcing God to listen to you. Persistent prayer is making you learn to listen to God. Sometimes you think God is not listening. God is saying, I'm listening, but I want you to listen to me. I remember this lady. She told my wife, she's a beauty queen, okay? So her beauty is not in question. But she said, I've been praying for the longest time. Up to now, 
I'm still single. How old are you? <clears throat> okay, so I, I won't reveal the age. But she has been a single a long time. My wife said, if you need a husband, God will give you what you need. If you don't have a husband now, God knows you don't need it now. Maybe someday. So when she heard the counsel of my wife, God will give you what you need. And then when you don't have what you need now, perhaps it's not a need. She got liberated. She was so happy. She said, you are right. If I need a husband, God will give me one. And the fact that no one is near the horizon, you know, wala. Sa Tagalog, awanin. There's nobody. So she kept herself busy serving the Lord. She, she got herself busy serving CCF. One year later, she came to us. And she said, guess what? God knows in his time, God provided somebody. Do you know why we know the story? We are Ninong and Ninang. We interviewed even the guy. Approved. Everything's approved. Godly man who serves the Lord. God knows the best time. Amen? Praise God. So, when you are praying and it's not answered, the first thing, perspective. God is your father. Next thing, why is there delay? God's plan. You will not know what is God's plan until you learn to wait and keep praying. What do I mean? Look at Psalm 27. What is God's plan? Many of us think prayer is only asking for things. Ah, read this together. Together. One thing I've asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. Notice that prayer. One thing I ask. You'll be thinking he'll be asking for things, for position, for power. No. One thing I ask. What is that thing? That I shall seek. Notice. One thing. One pursuit. For the rest of my life. All the days of my life. What is that? Everybody read. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. See, this is our danger. Christians, don't be shallow. Many of us love the things of God. We love blessings. No problem. But there is something greater than material blessings, than earthly blessings. The greatest blessing of prayer is God himself. Until you realize how precious, how great, how good God is, you will not have a hunger for him. And you will not know the beauty and sufficiency of God many times until you lose everything. Let me repeat. You will not know God is sufficient for your life until you lose everything and then you discover, by losing everything, you discover God is sufficient. You see, many of us have counterfeit gods. When I say counterfeit gods, you look for this thing, you look for this person, you look for relationship to make you happy. Think about it. What are you really praying for? Whatever that thing is, an answered prayer is God's way of examining your own heart. You ask yourself, why do I really want this? Why am I demanding that God answer this prayer? And you'll get surprised. Perhaps that thing is now your idol. You see, the worst sin is idolatry. Anything that takes the place of God in your life. It can be family, nothing wrong. It can be children, nothing wrong. It can be relationship, nothing wrong. Except when that thing becomes more important than God, that thing has become your idol. And your idol is guaranteed to disappoint you. Idols will never be able to fulfill its promises. 
Only God can fulfill the dreams of your life. Only God can truly satisfy. Amen? The context of this prayer will be amazing if you know the history of this. You see, David prayed this prayer. But you know, what is the background of this prayer? Look at verse 3. The verse before verse 4 is verse 3. Let's read verse 3. Though a host and come against me, my heart will not fear. Huh. Though war arise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. You know what David was saying? David was praying this prayer in the midst of danger, in the midst of war. What was his prayer? One more time, let's read. One thing I've asked from the Lord. You see, he did not ask, kill my enemy. He did not say, fulfill your promise in my life. See, God gave David a promise when he was a teenager. Can you tell me what was that promise? The Bible tells us when David was a youth, maybe 15 years old, 16 years old, when he was young, God told him, you will be the king. God anointed David. So everybody knew God's will, God's promise, you will be the next king. Why was David not a king, as of now. Who was stopping David from becoming king? The overstaying king. Who was the overstaying king? King Saul. King Saul was jealous of David. King Saul knew that David would be the future king. But he refused. He wanted to kill David. So the motto of King Saul is at all costs, look for David, Kill him. What did David do? He ran. Kept running. And then you will now appreciate chapter 27, the end of this verse, the end of this chapter. You know what's the end of this chapter? Let me share with you. The perspective of David and how David accepted God's plan. Let's read. David said, everybody, I would have despaired unless I believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, let your heart take courage, wait for the Lord. Did I show you the chart a while ago when prayers are not answered? Did I show you or no? Okay, I show you that chart. If you don't understand God's perspective, you don't understand God's plan, this is what will happen to you. If prayers are not answered, you get disappointed. David could have been disappointed. You promised me the kingdom, the kingdom, I'll be king. It's not happening. You get discouraged. When you get discouraged, you be careful. You get disillusioned. And worst of all, you are in despair. You give up hope. You know, some people have left Christianity because they have never been a Christian in the first place. They never understood theology. I'm warning you. In the face of disappointment, the tendency is you get discouraged. And when you get discouraged, the tendency is to be disillusioned with God. You will say, is God real? Is it worth it? I'm going to tell you right now, correct your perspective. Because if prayers are not answered, God has a wonderful reason. So look at David's prayer in Psalm 27. What did he say? I would have despaired. I would have despaired. Notice. I would have given up hope. Unless, unless what? Re let's read. Unless I believe, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Many people over spiritualize the Bible. You over spiritualize. You think all the promises are all about future. You think all the promises are all about spiritual blessings. Yes, but it's more than that. Do you believe? God wants to bless you. Yes or no? Does that include material blessing? Louder. Ah, you need now to a proper theology. I am not advocating prosperity theology. Name it, claim it. Lord, I want a Mercedes Benz. Boom. Oh, where's the Mercedes Benz? Oh, it's okay. 
BMW na lang. Lord, you see, I'm not teaching that. But I'm saying, God promised to bless you, yes or no. Now, whatever that blessing is, I tell you, many times it includes provision for your body, not just your soul. That's why we studied this last week, remember? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and what? And all of these things will be added unto you. But you've got to have the right perspective. Why is God delaying? Well, the reason why God is delaying, can I tell you why? Because delays is God's instrument to mold your character. It is God's ways of transforming your character. And let me repeat, God will sacrifice your character, your comfort for the sake of eternal good. So, what must you do? Everybody read. Together. Together. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. How many of you like waiting? Raise your hands. <laughs> you are the few exceptions, supernatural people. How many of you don't like waiting? You ask all the husbands. All the husbands. I learned waiting when I got married. You know why? Once you get married, husbands, the first thing you will learn is learn to wait. How many of you husbands identify with what I'm saying? Raise your hands. Let your wife see your hands. So they are not. You know why? Listen to me. I've learned that I'm very impatient. And I'm learning. Patience. You know, God wants you to learn to wait upon Him. By the way, ladies, I want you to try to improve your English language. When you tell your husband you are ready, you better mean it, I'm ready. Because for the men, ready means ready. But for a woman, ready has many meanings. Ready can mean I'm ready to put on my makeup. I'm ready to whatever. For us men, ready means what? Go. No. Ah, forget it. Men learn to be patient. But the hardest patience is this, waiting on the Lord. You know why you need to learn to wait on the Lord? Because your character is being transformed. Waiting. David learned to wait. God promised him, you will be king. But he did not become king. Can I tell you why? Because God's plan is, David, I need to mature you. A teenager cannot become a king. That would be a disaster. You need to learn what is the meaning of justice. You need to go through hardship. You need to go through a lot of spiritual training. David went through a lot of hardship. But notice what he said. Everybody read together. Wait for the Lord. He waited. Do you realize when David was running away from King Saul, David had opportunities to kill King Saul. One opportunity, when King Saul went to the cave, David was inside the cave. King Saul did not know that David was hiding in the cave. So what did King Saul do? What did he do in the cave? He went to the bathroom. In Tagalog, alam mo na, kasilyas, ang laki The biggest toilet, the whole cave. So the men of David said, this guy is dead. Let's kill him and all your misery will be over. David said, ah, don't do that. So he allowed King Saul to live. He told King Saul, I could have killed you. I did not. King Saul said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. A few years later, King Saul went after David again. And this time, King Saul was sleeping. He overslept. David and his men went to the camp. And right there and there, his bodyguard told him, Sir, this is the day. We don't have to run anymore. Let's kill him. Let's kill him now. David said, no, no, no. I cannot kill him. I will not kill him. You know what the bodyguard said? Okay, boss. You don't kill him. I will do it. He won't even feel the pain. What did David say? Oh, sige, huh? kill him, but don't, don't tell me how, 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 how you will do it. Is that what David did? 
No. The misery of David would have been over. Just kill King Saul. And then you become king. You know what David said? Remember, delays are always God's instrument in molding your character. God's plan for David is learn to trust me, David. Learn to see what I will do. And that's exactly what David did. He did not allow the end to justify the means. He did not compromise. Let, 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 let's find out. Look at first Samuel. David said to Abishai, that's his bodyguard, that's his right-hand man, do not destroy him, for who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed? Meaning, David respected the position of King Saul. He's the Lord's chosen one. How can I kill him? David said, everybody read, as the Lord lives, surely the Lord will strike him. Or his day will come that he dies. Or he will go down to battle and perish. You see what David is saying? If God wants him dead, God will do it. But not me. The Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. But now, please take the spear that is at his head and the jug of water, let us go. He did not allow his men to kill King Saul. Why? David understood prayer. The power of prayer. Lord, if it's the right time, I will be king. Now, you don't want me to be king. King Saul is still king. It takes faith to wait upon the Lord. So how do you persevere in prayer? Perspective. See God's perspective. God is real. God is alive. God is all-powerful. But you must know his plan. His plan is to mold your character while you are waiting. And then what's the next word I want you to remember? Promise. How do you apply that? Well, look at the promise. Look at first. Look at Luke chapter 11. What is the promise? Together read. Everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. Him who knocks, it'll be open again. If you read it based on the original, everyone who keeps on asking, you will receive. The one who keeps on seeking, you will find. The one who keeps on knocking, it'll be open. Wow, if you look at this verse, wow, what a universal promise. Therefore, I will claim it. Ah, read the next verse. What is the qualification of God answering your prayer? It's the heart of a father. What do I mean? If you ask for the wrong thing, he is not going to give it to you. Where do you see that? Let's read the next verse. Now, suppose one of you, fathers, the analogy now, go back from a friend to a father, is asked by his son, father and son, father and child relationship, for a fish. He will not give him a snake. Will he? In other words, God is saying, if you ask for a fish, I will surely give you a fish, not a snake. Vice versa. If you ask for a snake, I'm not going to give it to you. Because it's bad for you. So this verse tells us God will only answer your prayer in his mind if it's good for you. If he asks for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? See, ladies, many of you are single. And you like God to give you the desire of your heart, which is Mr. Charming. Do you know who is Mr. Charming? In your mind, this is it. Guys, for you, it's Madame Charming. Okay, Lord, I want to marry this girl. You are very sincere. In your mind, that is the best person. Except God sees better. God is saying, that boy is a snake. Why will I answer your prayer? You want to marry a snake? Gentlemen, you want to marry a scorpion? <laughs> That's the problem. So God will not answer your prayer when your request is a scorpion or a snake. It's not good for you. God will say no. I have something better. Therefore, 
Everybody read. If you then, being evil, it's a comparative statement. Human beings, compared to God, we are not holy. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, everybody read. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? In the book of Matthew, same thing. How much more will your heavenly Father give what is good to those who ask him? Now, I began to meditate on this verse. Why did he mention the Holy Spirit? Can I tell you why? Because the Holy Spirit is the greatest gift that God can give you. Let me repeat. The Holy Spirit is Jesus Christ himself. Once you have the Holy Spirit, you have everything. The gift, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Remember? The Holy Spirit is the presence of God in your life. And God is saying, you're asking for all of those? I have something better for you. I'll give you myself. Once you have God's Spirit, you have everything. You have power. You have eternal life. Many of us are looking for the right thing in the wrong places. There's nothing wrong to seek happiness. Nothing wrong. Your problem is this. You are looking for happiness in the wrong place. You are looking for happiness in a person. You will never find it. Take it from me. Happiness can only be found in Jesus Christ. Amen? So, many times you don't even know what you're asking for. We ask for the wrong thing. But what is God's promise? God's promise. I will give you what is best for you. You like that promise? I will give you what is best for you. Therefore, pray. Keep praying. And if your prayer is wrong, don't worry. God will not answer that. But when do you stop praying? When do you stop praying for something? Very simple. You keep praying, claim God's promises, until it tells you to stop. When God tells you to stop, you stop. But until he gives you the permission, until God gives you the permission to stop praying for something, as long as it's aligned with God's will, notice, the qualification of these promises is very clear. God's will. Look at 1 John chapter 5. You better understand the qualification of how God promised to answer our prayers together. This is the confidence which we have before him. Everybody please read. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So you must understand what is God's will, God's promises, and then you claim it. Keep on claiming it until God tells you, stop. Now I'll give you an example of the power of claiming God's promises. The best example I can think of is Elijah. The Bible tells us Elijah was effective in prayer, but you don't know the secret. If you just look at the New Testament, you will not understand everything. Because the New Testament tells you only a part of his life. This is what the New Testament says. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. So the Bible is now describing Elijah. His prayer life was effective because he was living in accordance with the will of God. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. In other words, Elijah is just like you, just like me. He's not perfect. Notice, example of his powerful prayer. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. It did not rain on the earth for three and a half years. He prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Superficially, when you look at this verse, you say, wow, Elijah was such a man of power. He prayed, no rain, no rain. Then he prayed, rain, there's rain. Yes or no? That is until you understand the Old Testament. The Old Testament is not giving Elijah the credit for no rain. It is God's promise. It is God's will. What do I mean? You see, God told Elijah, 
You go see King Ahab and tell him, because he was wicked, he was evil, I will stop the rain. There won't be any rain. Elijah got the message from God. He got the promise of God, no rain. So he sent a message to King Ahab. King Ahab, you need to repent. No rain. So now you understand, it was not Elijah's idea to have no rain. It was God's idea. It was God's command. It was God's will. It was God's promises. After three and a half years, God told Elijah, now you go tell the king, I will send rain. Because King Ahab got the shock of his life. He realized who God is. So look at that verse in 1 Kings chapter 18. Let's read together. It happened after many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the face of the earth. Elijah was simply an instrument of God. You see, God could have sent rain without Elijah, but God said, now I promise you there will be rain. You go tell King Ahab. No. Where is the power? Is it God or Elijah? Answer. Excuse me? God or Elijah? Oh, I'll show you the next verse. Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of the roar of a heavy shower. Now, if you look at the Bible, there was no rain. But he said, heavy shower. I hear it, it's coming. But there was no rain. The power is from where? Let's find out. Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. He crouched down on the earth. He put his face between his knees. He said to his servant, go up, look toward the sea. Now, for you to understand geography, I, those of you who went with me to Holy Land, I bring people to Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel is the place where you will see the Mediterranean Sea. So it is, you can see it clearly. That's where Elijah was. He said, okay, you go, see. So they went and see. He went up and looked and said, everybody read. Boss, there is nothing. He said, go back seven times. What was Elijah asking the servant to see? Let me tell you, read the next verse. What was he supposed to see? It came about at the seventh time that he said, behold, a cloud as small as a man's hand is coming up from the sea, from the Mediterranean Sea, from the west. Go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot. Go down so that the heavy shower does not stop you. In a little while, the sky grew black with clouds and the wind, and there was a heavy rain. So question. Can God send the rain without Elijah? Answer? Of course. So why? This is theology. You now understand the privilege of God's people. God is allowing Elijah to become his partner in accomplishing his task. Just like you, just like me. God wants you to be prayerful. Not because you have power but he's giving you the privilege of partnering with him, God unleashes his power when you persevere in prayer. It's a mystery. It makes me cry. You know why? Because God does not need me. Do you know God can use a monkey to preach? Yes or no? Yeah. God can use a donkey to speak. So God can use a monkey, but he's using this particular monkey sometimes. Huh? It's amazing. God is saying, I will make you my partner. This is how you pray. Someday when you go to heaven, it will be a miss. How much unclaimed promises that you have wasted in your life because you fail to understand the heart of God. God is giving you opportunity to partner with him. The problem is this. When God keeps saying no, 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 what must you do? <laughs> Let me tell you now, the theology of the no. You know, when God says no, 
I want you to remember this quotation, okay? You must keep praying. You know what is the fourth P? The fourth P is praise. When God says no to you or when God says wait, what must you do? Say that with me. You praise him. You thank him in advance. You know why? Let me tell you. This quotation is so, I, I, I find it so encouraging. Persistent prayer says, I will continue to pray until God answers my prayer or tells me to stop praying. Whatever his answer, I will praise and thank him. Persistent prayer is you keep praying until God answers your prayer. Or you keep praying until he tells you to stop. But if God has not given you permission to stop praying, you keep praying. Example, Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul prayed. And God said, uh-uh. Stop praying. Moses prayed. Allow me to enter the promised land. God said, "Uh uh-uh, no. You see, God tells his people when to stop praying. So if I were you, you are praying for the husband, don't give up. It's God's will for your husband to change. Keep praying. You are praying for your children, keep praying. Don't give up. In the case of Paul, God told him, stop. What do I mean? Let's close with the example of Paul. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Notice, he repeated two times God's purpose for not answering his prayer. Remember, he said, concerning this, I implored the Lord three times. He prayed. Lord, remove the thorn in the flesh. Now, we do not know what is the thorn in the flesh. But many scholars would like to believe that thorn in the flesh is a real physical ailment. Malaria, eye problem, whatever it is, it's a physical ailment. Why will God allow Paul to go through pain? Why? Higher purpose. Remember I told you? Perspective. God's plan, promises. What was God's plan, purpose? Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations. You see, God gave Paul amazing revelation. He saw a glimpse of heaven. And Paul said, it was so beautiful, I cannot write it down. Because God told me, don't write it down. Just for your eyes only. Amazing revelation. But then Paul said something unusual. To keep me from exalting myself. To allow me to continue to be humble, there was a thorn. That word thorn is not a small thorn. It's like a wooden stake. The word used is to torment me. So Paul was in physical discomfort. Friends, I learned something. God will sacrifice your physical comfort for your character development. God cares more about your eternal good than your physical comfort. That's why God allowed him to go through pain, to keep me from exalting myself. In the eyes of God, humility is a greater blessing than physical comfort. In the eyes of God, grace is more important. Read the next verse. Because he has said to me, everybody read, my grace is sufficient for you. Power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, notice, he began to praise God most gladly. Therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. When I am weak, I am well content with weakness, with insults, with distresses, with persecution, with difficulties. For Christ's sake. Everybody read. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. Pray. When you persevere in prayer, you unleash what? God's power. You unleash God's power when you persevere, when you surrender, and when you say, Lord, I thank you in advance for the no. I thank you in advance for what you will do. Are you able to praise God right now? 
If you are praying for something that God has not answered, you thank him right now. Amen? So begin to say, Lord, I thank you. For all your answered prayers, you thank him. One of my favorite verse is found in Psalm. The book of Psalm tells us, 34 verse 10, together, O taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Ladies and gentlemen, is the Lord good? Yes or no? Some of you don't know. You will not know if honey is sweet. You can only hear from people, honey is good, honey is sweet. But you will not know until you taste it. Many of you have heard about God. Yeah, God is good. But for you, it's second-hand information. Today, I'd like you to change. You'll only persevere in prayer when you believe in your heart that God is good. Notice, taste and see that the Lord is what? Good. Can you turn to your neighbor, tell your neighbor the Lord is good. The Lord is really good. I'm telling you now, taste and see. Many of you have not tasted the Lord. You hear about it. You have religion, but you have no personal encounter with God. That's very sad. Life is too short to miss out on God's best. Notice, he says, the young lions lack and suffer hunger. But look at the condition. They who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. Here's a promise. Condition, seek God. Prioritize him. And the Bible promises you, you will not lack what? You will not want, you will not be in lack of any good thing. Is God good? Yes or no? Does God want to bless you? Yes or no? Louder. Okay, praise God. Tell your neighbor, God is good. Because God is good, what must, what must you do? Persevere in prayer. The answer can only be as follows. No. Why no? I have something better. Wait. Why wait? You are not ready. You see, David was not ready to receive the kingdom. The apostle Paul was given something better. In exchange for physical pain, I will give you grace. In exchange for physical pain, I will give you power. And you know, in light of eternity, you can say amen. What you have for me is much, much better than what I will have in this world. The longest time you will have in this world is 100 years. 100 years from now, let me tell you something. All of you will not be here anymore. Yes or no? Where will you be? Just make sure you are there. How can you be sure you are there? You ask yourself, do you know the Lord? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And how do you know you know the Lord? Your prayer life. Let's bow our heads and pray. If God has been speaking to you, and today you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you want to really taste and see that the Lord is good, pray this prayer with me. Wherever you are, you pray this prayer. Lord, I want to experience your goodness. I want to really know you. I now ask you, Jesus, to give me a heart of humility. I repent of my sins. Like the Apostle Paul, Lord, I accept whatever is your will for my life. And I thank you in advance for all that you will do in my life, through my life. Oh, Lord, thank you. You are good. I now receive you as my Lord and my Savior. I surrender all. I surrender my prayer requests. I surrender my own desire. I only want you, Lord Jesus. Help me to develop a real appetite and a love for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. God bless you. Hey there, CCF family. Welcome to Sunday Fast Track, where you ask real-life questions and we give you biblical truths. 
My name is Tej Sosa, Campus Missionary from Elevate's Youth Ministry, and we're here today with our speaker, Pastor Peter Tanchi, to answer some of your questions. Good day, Pastor Peter. Praise God for your message about persevering in prayer. How are you, po, Pastor Peter? Excellent. Excellent. You? I'm good. Also, Pastor Peter, we're excited to unpack the message with you by answering some questions. Are you ready for our questions, Pastor Peter? Yes, yes. All right. So for our first question, if God's timing is perfect, why does He seem to delay answering my prayers? You just answered your own question. God's timing is perfect. Yeah. Therefore, that means He will delay it because His timing is perfect, not your timing. Mm. Yeah, that's right, Pastor Peter. I believe we need to trust that God's timing is always perfect. Dependence on the Lord. For our second question, is there a difference between persevering in prayer and praying repetitive prayers? I think there's a big difference. Repetitive prayers is like what we are used to when you memorize prayers. You just repeat it again and again, trying to convince somebody or tire them out. That's repetitive. But persevering prayer can also be silent. You just come before the Lord. God knows your heart and you express your heart to Him. So I would say persevering prayer has to do more with the heart than with the mouth. Praise God. God really knows our hearts. So sometimes our prayers can be silent, but God still hears the prayers of our heart. Praise God for that, Pastor Peter. For our last question, how can we encourage our brothers and sisters who may be starting to get tired or grow weary in their prayer life? Perspective. So you don't get tired. Because you know God knows what's best. Remember? Perspective. And then see God's plan in causing you to be waiting because that's where you grow. God's plan, many times, is to use delays to make us grow. And then promise. Some promises are not fulfilled immediately. So to be motivated, you say, Lord, I'll claim this promise. No matter what, I'm going to claim this. And that's how you overcome weariness. You have to start with your perspective, align with God's plan, claim His promises, and last, if not the most important, you express that faith by thanking Him. You thank God. Yeah, praise God, Pastor Peter. Thank you for answering our questions. It really helps us to trust and depend on God more. But before you go, if you are a student or a young working professional looking for a community to grow with, we'd like to invite you to our Saturday night service or SNS every Saturday at 5 p.m. here at the CCF Center. And if you are a student and if you want to be part of a community and to take part in making an impact for God in your campus, visit the Elevate Main Facebook page to know more about how you can get involved. We're excited to see you here. And that's it for CCF Sunday Fast Track. God bless. God bless.